The Liturgical Year Lent by the Very Reverend Dom Prosper Geringer Preface We begin with this volume, The Holy Season of Lent, but such is the richness of its liturgy that we have found it impossible to take our readers beyond the Saturday of the fourth week. Passion and Holy Weeks, which complete the forty days of yearly penance, require to be treated at such length that we could not have introduced them into this volume without making it inconveniently large. The present volume is a very full one, although it only comprises the first four weeks of the season of Lent. We have called it Lent, and yet the two weeks of the next volume are also comprised in Lent. Nay, they are its most important and sacred part. But in giving the name of Lent to this first series, we have followed the liturgy itself, which applies this word to the first four weeks only, giving to that two that remain the names of Passion Week and Holy Week. Our next volume will, therefore, be called Passion Tide and Holy Week. We fervently hope that our readers who have entered into the spirit of the Church during Septuagesima will do the same for the season which now begins, and for this end they should attentively study the lessons from the Scripture selected by the Church for each day. To these epistles and gospels we have added our humble comments. Such is the richness of the instruction contained in these venerable Lenten instructions, that we might have written a volume for each week, and yet we have been obliged to content ourselves with a few short words for explanation. There are so few persons nowadays who have a knowledge of the sacred scriptures that frequently what was most familiar with our Catholic forefathers is perfectly ignored by those of the present generation. May God deign to bless these feeble efforts and give to our people the spirit of understanding of holy things, which supports faith and makes practice fervent. Chapter 1. The History of Lent The forty days fast, which we call Lent, in most languages the name given to this fast, expresses the number of the day, forty. But our word, Lent, signifies the spring fast, for Lenten tide, in the ancient English-Saxon language, was the season of spring. Is the Church's preparation for Easter and was instituted at the very commencement of Christianity. Our blessed Lord himself sanctioned it by his fasting forty days and forty nights in the desert, and though he would not impose it on the world by an express commandment, which then could not have been open to the power of dispensation, yet he showed plainly enough by his own example that fasting, which God had so frequently ordered in the old law, was to be practiced by the children of the new. The disciples of St. John the Baptist came one day to Jesus and said to him, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast. See Matthew chapter 9, chapter 9 verse 14 to 15. Hence we find it mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles how the disciples of our Lord, after the foundation of the church, applied themselves to fasting. In their epistles also they recommended it to the faithful, nor could it be otherwise, though the divine mysteries whereby our Savior wrought our redemption have been consummated, yet are we still sinners, and where there is sin there must be expiation. The apostles therefore legislated for our weakness, by instituting at the very commencement of the Christian church that the solemnity of Easter should be preceded by a universal fast, and it was only natural that they should have made this period of penance to consist of forty days, seeing that our divine master had consecrated that number by his own fast. St. Jerome, in his epistle uh, in his twenty in his epistle chapter twenty eight Ad Marcellum, St. Leo the Great in his Sermon on Quadragesima, St. Cyril of Alexandria in his homily on the, pa- on the Paschal Tide, St. Isidore of Seville in his De Ecclesiasticus, and others of the Holy Fathers assure us that Lent was instituted by the Apostles, although at the commencement there was no uniform way of observing it. We have already seen in our Septuagesima that the Orientals begin their Lent much earlier than the Latins, owing to their custom of never fasting on Saturdays, or in some places even on Thursdays. They are consequently obliged, in order to make up the forty days, to begin the Lenten fast on the Monday preceding our Sexagesima Sunday. These are the kinds of exceptions which which prove the rule. We have also shown how the Latin Church, 
which even so late as the 6th century, kept only 36 fasting days during the six weeks of Lent, for the church has never allowed Sundays to be kept as days of fast. Thought proper to add later on, the last four days of Quinga Gesima, in order that her Lent might contain exactly 40 days of fast. The whole subject of Lent has been so often and so fully treated that we shall abridge as much as possible the history we are now giving. The nature of our work forbids us to do more than insert what is essential for the entering into the spirit of each season. God grant that we may succeed in showing to the faithful the importance of the Holy Institute of Lent, its influence on the spiritual life and on the very salvation of each one of us can never be overrated. Lent, then, is a time consecrated and in a special manner to penance, and this penance is mainly practiced by fasting. Fasting is an abstinence which man voluntarily imposes upon himself as an expiation for sin in which during Lent is practiced in obedience to the general law of the church. According to the actual discipline of the Western Church, the fast of Lent is not more rigorous than that prescribed for the vigils of certain feasts and for the Ember Days, but it is kept up for forty successive days with the single interruption of the intervening Sundays. We deem it unnecessary to show the importance and advantages of fasting. The sacred scriptures, both of the Old and New Testament, are filled with the praises of this holy practice. The traditions of every nation of the world testify the universal veneration in which it has ever been held. For there is not a people nor a religion, how much soever it may have lost the purity of primitive traditions, which is not impressed with this conviction, that man may appease his God by subjecting his body to penance. St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, St. Jerome, and St. Gregory the Great make the remark that the commandment put upon our first parents in the earthly paradise was one of abstinence, and that it was by their not exercising this virtue that they brought every kind of evil upon themselves and us their children. The life of privation which the king of creation had thenceforward to lead on the earth, for the earth was to yield him nothing of its own natural growth save thorns and thistles, was the clearest possible exemplification of the law of penance, imposed by the anger of God on rebellious man. During the two thousand and more years which preceded the deluge, men had no other food than the fruits of the earth, and these were only got by the toil of hard labor. But when God, as we have already observed, mercifully shortened man's life, that he so may have less time and power for sin, he permitted him to eat the flesh of the animals, as an additional nourishment in that state of deteriorated strength. It was then also that Noah, guided by a divine inspiration, extracted the juice of the grape, which thus formed a second stay for human debility. Fasting, then, is the abstaining from such nourishments as these, which were permitted for the support of bodily strength. At first it consisted in abstinence from flesh meat, because it is a food that was given to man by God out of condescension to his weakness, and not as one absolutely essential for the maintenance of life. In its privation, greater or less according to the regulations of the church, is essential to the very notion of fasting. Thus, whilst in many countries the use of eggs, milk meat, and even drippings and lard is tolerated, the abstaining from flesh meat is everywhere maintained as being essential to fasting. For many centuries, eggs and milk meat were not allowed because they come under the class of animal food. Even to this day, they are forbidden in the Eastern churches and are only allowed in the Latin church by virtue of an annual dispensation. The precept of abstaining from flesh meat is so essential to Lent that even on Sundays, when the fasting is interrupted, abstinence is an obligation, binding even on those who are dispensed from the fasts of the week, unless there be a special dispensation granted for eating meat on the Sundays. In the early ages of Christianity, fasting included also the abstaining from wine, as we learn from St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, Theophilus of Alexandria, and others. In the West, this custom soon fell into disuse. The early Christians kept it up much longer, but even with them it has ceased to be considered as obligatory. Lastly, fasting includes the depriving ourselves of some portion of our ordinary food, inasmuch as it only allows the taking of one meal during the day. Though the modification introduced from age to age in the discipline of Lent are very numerous, yet the points we have here mentioned belong to the very essence of fasting, as is evident from the universal practice of the Church. It was the custom with the Jews in the old law not to take the one meal, allowed on fasting days till sunset. The Christian Church adopted the same custom. It was scrupulously practiced for many centuries, even in our Western countries, but about the ninth century some relaxation began to be introduced in the Latin Church. Thus we have a capillitarium of Theodolf, Theodolf, bishop of Orleans, who lived in that period, protesting against the practice, which some had of taking the repast at the hour of known, that is to say, about three o'clock in the afternoon. 
The re relaxation, however, gradually spread. For in the 10th century, we find the celebrated Retherius, Bishop of Verona, acknowledging that the faithful had permission to break their fast at the hour of noon. We meet with a sort of reclamation made as late as the 11th century by a council held at Rouen, which forbids the faithful to take their repast before vespers shall have begun to be sung in the church at the end of noon. But this shows us that the custom had already begun of anticipating the hour of vespers, in order that the faithful might take their meal earlier in the day. Up to within a short period before this time, it had been the custom not to celebrate Mass on days of fasting until the office of Non had been sung, which was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and also not to sing vespers until sunset. When the discipline regarding fasting began to relax, the church still retained the order of her offices, which had been handed down from the earliest times. The only change she made was to anticipate the hour of Vespers, and this entailed the celebrating Mass and Non much earlier in the day, so early indeed that when custom had so prevailed as to authorize the faithful taking the repast at midday, all the offices, even the Vespers, were over before that hour. In the 12th century, the custom of breaking one's fast at the hour of Non everywhere prevailed, as we learn from the Hugh St. Victor, and in the 13th century it was sanctioned by the teaching of schoolmen. Alexander Hales declares most expressly that such a custom was lawful, and St. Thomas of Aquinas is equally decided in the same opinion. But even the fasting till noon was found too severe, and a still further relaxation was considered to be necessary. At the close of the 13th century, we have the celebrated Franciscan, Richard of Middleton, teaching that they who break their fast at the hour of sex, midday, are not to be considered as transgressing the precept of the church. And the reason he gives is this, that the custom of doing so had already prevailed in many places, and that fasting does not consist so much in the lateness of the hour at which the faithful take the refreshment, as in their taking but one meal during the twenty-four hours. The fourteenth century gave weight, both by universal custom and theological authority, to the opinion held by Richard of Middleton, it will perhaps suffice if we quote the learned Dominican, Durandus, Bishop of Mao, who says that though there can be no doubt as to the lawfulness of taking one's repast at midday, and he adds that such was the custom observed by the Pope and cardinals and even the religious orders, we cannot therefore be surprised at finding this opinion maintained in the 15th century by such grave authors of St. Antonius, Cardinal Cajetan, and others. Alexander Hales and St. Thomas sought to prevent the relaxation going beyond the hour of noon, but their zeal was disappointed and the present discipline was established, we might almost say, during their lifetime. But whilst this relaxation of taking the repast so early in the day as twelve o'clock rendered fasting less difficult in one way, it made it more severe in another. The body grew exhausted by the labors of the long second half of the twenty-four hours, and the meal that formerly closed the day and satisfied the cravings of fatigue had already been taken. It was found necessary to grant some refreshment for the evening, and it was called a collation. The word was taken from the Benedictine rule, which, for long centuries before this change in the Lenten observance, had allowed a monastic collation. St. Benedict's rule prescribed a great many fasts over and above the ecclesiastical fast of Lent, but it made this great distinction between the two, that whilst Lent obliged the monks, as well as the rest of the faithful, to abstain from food till sunset, these monastic fasts allowed the repast to be taken at the hour of noon. But as the monks had heavy manual labor during the summer and autumn months, which was the very time when the fast till noon occurred several days each week, and indeed every day from the 14th of September, the abbot was allowed by the rule to grant his religious permission to take a small measure of wine before Compline, as a refreshment after the fatigues of the afternoon. It was taken by all at one and at the same time during the evening reading, which was called conference, in Latin, collatio, because it was mostly taken from the celebrated conferences of Cassian, Hence, this evening monastic refreshment got the name of collation. We find the assembly of or chapter of I la Chapelle held in 817, extending this indulgence even to the Lenten fast, on account of the great fatigue entailed by the offices, which the monks had to celebrate during this holy season. But experience showed that unless something solid were allowed to be taken together with the wine, the evening collation would be an injury to the health of many of the religious. Accordingly, towards the close of the 14th or beginning of the 15th century, the usage was introduced of taking a morsel of bread with the collation beverage. As a matter of course, these mitigations of the ancient severity of fasting soon found their way from the cloister into the world. The custom of taking something to drink on fasting days out of the time of her past was gradually established, and even so, as early as the 13th century, we have St. Thomas of Aquinas dis discussing the question, 
whether or not drink is to be considered as a breaking of the precept of fasting. He answers in the negative, and yet he does not allow that anything solid may be taken with the drink. But when it had become the universal practice, as it did in the latter part of the 13th century, and still more fixedly during the whole of the 14th, that the one meal on fasting days was taken at midday, a mere beverage was found insufficient to give support, and there was added to it bread, herbs, fruit, etc. Such was the practice, both in the world and the cloister. It was, however, clearly understood by all that these eatables were not to be taken in such quantity as to turn the collation into a second meal. Thus did the decay of piety and the general deteriorations of bodily strength among the people of the Western nations infringe on the primitive observance of fasting. To make our history of these humiliating changes anything like complete, we must mention one more relaxation. For several centuries, abstinence from flesh meat included likewise the prohibition of every article of food that belonged to what is called the animal kingdom, with the single exception of fish, which on account of its cold nature, as also for several mystical reasons, founded on the sacred scriptures, was always permitted to be taken by those who fasted. Every sort of milk meat was forbidden, and in Rome, even to this day, butter and cheese are not permitted during Lent except on those days wherein permission to eat meat is granted. Dating from the 9th century, the custom of eating milk meats during Lent began to be equivalent in Western Europe, more especially in Germany and the northern countries. The Council of Kettlemerg, held in the 11th century, made an effort to put a stop to the practice as an abuse, but without effect. These churches maintained that they were in the right and defended their custom by the dispensations, though in reality only tempor temporary ones, granted them by several sovereign pontiffs. The dispute ended by their being left peaceably to enjoy what they claimed. The churches of France resisted this innovation up to the 16th century, but in the 17th they too yielded and milk meats were taken during Lent throughout the whole kingdom. As some reparation for this breach of ancient discipline, the city of Paris instituted a solemn rite, whereby she wished to signify her regret at being obliged to such a re relaxation. On Quinquagesima Sunday, all the different parishes went into procession to the Church of Notre Dame. The Dominicans, Franciscans, Carmelites, and Augustinians took part in the procession. The Metropolitan Chapter and the four parishes that were subject to it held on the same day a station in the courtyard of the palace and sang an anthem before the relic of the true cross, which was exposed in the Saint Chapelle. These pious usages, which were intended to remind the people of the difference between the past and the present observation of Lent, continued to be practiced till the Revolution. But this grant for eating milk meats during Lent did not include eggs. Here the ancient discipline was maintained, at least this far. That eggs were not allowed, save by a dispensation, which had to be renewed each year. In Rome, they are only allowed on days when flesh meat may be taken. In other places, they are allowed on some days. And on others, especially during Holy Week, are forbidden. Invariably do we find the church, seeking out of anxiety for the spiritual advantage of her children, to maintain all she can of those penitential observances, whereby they may satisfy divine justice. It was with this intention that Pope Benedict XIV, alarmed at the excessive facility wherewith dispensation were then obtained, renewed by a solemn constitution dated June 10, 1745, the prohibition of eating flesh, eating fish and meat at the same meal on fasting days. The same Pope, whose spirit of moderation has never been called in question, had no sooner ascended the papal throne than he addressed an encyclical letter to the bishops of the Catholic world, expressing his heartfelt grief at seeing the great relaxation that was introduced among the faithful by indiscreet and unnecessary dispensations. The letter is dated May 30, 1741. We extract from it the following passage, quote, The observance of Lent is the very badge of the Christian warfare, by it we prove ourselves not to be enemies of the cross of Christ. By it we avert the scourges of divine justice. By it we gain strength against the princes of darkness, for it shields us with heavenly help. Should mankind grow remiss in their observance of Lent, it would be a detriment to God's gl glory, a disgrace to the Catholic religion and a danger to Christian souls. Neither can it be doubted, but that such negligence would become the source of misery to the world, of public calamity, and of private woe. End quote. More than a hundred years have elapsed since this solemn warning of the Vicar of Christ was given to the world, and during that time the relaxation he inveighed against has gone on gradually increasing. How few Christians do we meet who are strict observers of Lent, even in its present mild form? The long list of general dispensations granted each year by the bishops to their flocks would lead us to suppose that the immense majority of the faithful would be scrupulously exact in the fulfillment of the fasting and abstinence still remaining, but is such the case? 
as must there not result from this ever-growing spirit of immortification a general effeminacy of character, which will lead at last to frightful social disorders. The sad predictions of Pope Benedict XIV are but too truly verified. Those nations among whose people the spirit and practice of penance are extinct are heaping against themselves the wrath of God, and provoking his justice to destroy them by one or other of these scourges, civil discord or conquest. In our own country, there is an inconsistency which must strike every thinking mind. The observance of the Lord's Day, on the one side, the national inobservance of days of penance and fasting, on the other. The first is admirable, and we accept puritanical extravagances, bespeaks a deep-rooted sense of religion, but the second is one of the worst presages for the future. No, the word of God is too plain. Unless we do penance, we shall perish. See the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verse 3. But if our ease-loving and sensual generation were to return, like the Ninevites, to the long-neglected way of penance and expiation, who knows, but that the arm of God, which is already raised to strike us, may give us blessing and not chastisement. Let us resume our history and seek our edification in studying the fervor wherewith the Christians of former times used to observe Lent. We will first offer to our readers a few instances of the manner in which dispensations were given. In the 13th century, the Archbishop of Braga applied to the reigning pontiff, Innocent III, asking him what compensation he ought to require of his people, who in consequence of a dearth of the ordinary articles of food, had been necessitated to eat meat during the Lent. He at the same time consulted the pontiff as to how he was to act in the case of the sick, who asked for a dispensation from abstinence. The answer given by Innocent, which is inserted in the canon law, is, as we might expect, full of considerations and charity. But we learn from this fact that such was then the respect for the law of Lent, that it was considered necessary to apply to the sovereign pontiff when dispensations were sought for. We may find many such instances in the history of the church. Wenceslaus, king of Bohemia, being seized with a malady which rendered it dangerous to his health to take Lenten diet, he applied in the years 1297 to Pope Boniface VIII for leave to eat meat. The pontiff commissioned two Cistercian abbots to inquire into the real state of the prince's health. They were to grant the dispensation sought for if they found it necessary, but on the following conditions. The king had not bound himself by a vow for life to fast during Lent. That the Fridays, Saturdays, and the vigil of St. Matthias were to be excluded from the dispensation. And lastly, that the king was not to take his meal in the presence of others, and was to observe moderation in what he took. In the 14th century, we meet with two briefs of dispensation, granted by Clement VI in 1351 to John, king of France, and to his queen consort. In the first, the pope, taking into consideration that during the wars in which the king is engaged, he frequently finds himself in places where fish can with difficulty be procured, grants to the confessor of the king the power of allowing, both to his majesty and his suite, the use of meat on days of abstinence, excepting, however, the whole of Lent, all Fridays of the year and certain vigils, provided, moreover, that neither he nor those who accompany him are under a vow of perpetual abstinence. In the second, brief the same pope, replying to the petition made him by the king for a dispensation from fasting, again commissions his majesty's present and future confessors to, defense, to dispense both the king and his queen after having consulted with their physicians. A few years later, that is, in 1376, Pope Gregory XI sent a brief in favor of Charles V, king of France, and of Jane, his queen. In this brief, he delegates to their confessor the power of allowing them the use of eggs and milk meats during Lent, should their physician think they stand in need of such dispensation. But he tells both physicians and confessor that he puts in it in their consciences that they will have to answer before God for their decision. The same permission is granted also to their servants and cooks, but only as far as it is needed for their tasting the food to be served to their majesties. The 15th century also furnishes us with instances of this applying to the Holy See for Lenten dispensations. We will cite the brief addressed by Sistus IV in 1483 to James III, King of Scotland, in which he grants permission to eat meat on days of abstinence, provided his confessor consider the dispensation needed. In the following century, we have Julius II granting a like dispensation to John, king of Denmark, and to his queen, Christina, and a few years later, Clement VII giving one to Emperor Charles V, and again to Henry II of Navarre, and to his queen, Margaret. Thus were the princes themselves treated three centuries ago when they sought for a dispensation from the sacred law of Lent. What are we to think of the present indifference wherewith it is kept, 
what comparison can be made between the Christians of former times, who deeply impressed with the fear of God's judgment and with the spirit of penance, cheerfully went through these 40 days of mortification? In those of our own days, when love of pleasure and self-indulgence is forever lessening man's horror for sin. Where there is little or no fear of having to penance ourselves for sin, there is so much the less restraint to keep us from committing it. Where now that simple and innocent joy at Easter, which our forefathers used to show when, after their severe fast of Lent, they partook of substantial and savory food. The peace, which long and sharp mortification ever brings to the conscience, gave them the capability, not to say the right, of being light-hearted as they returned to the comforts of life, which they had denied themselves in order to spend forty days in penance, recollection, and retirement from the world. This leads us to mention some further details, which will assist the Catholic reader to understand what Lent was in the ages of faith. It was a season during which not only all amusements and theatrical entertainments were forbidden by the civil authority— but when even the law courts were closed, and this in order to secure that peace and calm of heart, which is so indispensable for the soul's self-examination and reconciliation which with her offended maker. As early as in the year 380, Gratian and Theodosius enacted that judges should suspend all lawsuits and proceedings during the 40 days preceding Easter. The Theodosian Code contains several regulations of this nature, and we find councils held in the ninth century urging the kings of that period to enforce the one we have mentioned, seeing that it had been sanctioned by the canons and approved of by the fathers of the church. These admirable Christian traditions have long since fallen into disuse in the countries of Europe, but they are still kept up among the Turks, who during the 40 days of their Ramadan forbid all law proceedings. What a humiliation for us Christians! Hunting, too, was for many ages considered as forbidden during Lent. The spirit of the holy season was too sacred to admit such exciting and noisy sport. The Pope, St. Nicholas I, in the ninth century, forbade it to the Bulgarians, who had been recently converted to the Christian faith. Even so late as the 13th century, we find St. Raymond of Pegnafort teaching that they who, during Lent, take part in the chase, if it be accompanied by certain circumstances, which he specifies, cannot be excused from sin. This prohibition has long since been a dead letter, but St. Charles Borromeo, in one of his synods, re-established it in his province of Milan. But we cannot be surprised that hunting should be forbidden during Lent, when we remember that in those Christian times, war itself, which is sometimes so necessary for the welfare of a nation, was suspended during this holy season. In the fourth season, we in the fourth century, we have the Emperor Constantine the Great enacting that no military exercises should be allowed on Sundays and Fridays, out of respect to our Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered and rose again on these two days, as also in order not to disturb the peace and repose needed for the due celebration of such sublime mysteries. The discipline of the Latin Church in the ninth century enforced everywhere the suspension of war during the whole of Lent, except in cases of necessity. The instructions of Pope St. Nicholas I to the Bulgarians recommended the same observance, and we learn from a letter of St. Gregory VII to Desiderius, abbot of Monte Cassino, that it was kept up in the 11th century. We have an instance of it being practiced in our own country in the 12th century, when, as William of Malmesbury relates, the Empress Matilda, Countess of Anjou, and the daughter of King Henry, was contesting the right of succession to the throne against Stephen, Count of Boulogne. The two armies were inside of each other, but an armistice was, arms, armistice was demanded and observed, for it was the Lent of 1143. Our readers have heard no doubt of the admirable institution called God's Truce, whereby the church in the 11th century succeeded in preventing much bloodshed. It was a law that forbade the carrying arms from Wednesday evening till Monday morning throughout the year. It was sanctioned by the authority of popes and councils and enforced by all Christian precepts. It was a continuing during four days of each week of the year, the Lenten discipline of the suspension of war. Our saintly king, Edward the Confessor, gave a still greater extension to it by passing a law, which was confirmed by his successor, William the Conqueror, that God's truce should be observed without cessation from the beginning of Advent to the octave of Easter, from the ascension to the Whitsuntide octave, all on the Ember Days, on the vigils of all feasts, and lastly, every week from noon on Wednesday till Monday morning, which had already been prescribed. In the Council of Claremont, held in 1095, Pope Urban II, after drawing up the regulations for the Crusades, used his authority in extending God's truce, as it was then observed during Lent. His decree, which was renewed in the Council, held the following year at Rouen, was to this effect, 
that all proceedings should be suspended from Ash Wednesday to the Monday after the Octave of Pentecost, and in all vigils and feasts of the Blessed Virgin and the Apostles, over and above what was already regulated for each week, that is, from Wednesday evening to Monday morning. Thus did the world testify to its respect for the holy observances of Lent, and borrow some of its wisest institutions from the seasons and feasts of the liturgical year. The influence of this forty days' penance was great, too, on each individual. It renewed man's energies, gave him fresh vigor in battling with animal instincts, and, by the restraint it put upon sensuality, ennobled the soul. Yet there was restraint everywhere, and the present discipline of the Church, which forbids the solemnization of marriage during Lent, reminds Christians of that holy continency, which for many ages was observed during the whole forty days as a precept, of which the most sacred of the liturgical books, the Missal, still retains the recommendation. It is with reluctance that we close our history of Lent and leave untouched so many interesting details. For instance, what treasures we could have laid open to our readers from the Lenten usages of the Eastern churches, which have retained so much of the primitive discipline. We cannot, however, resist devotion, devoting our last page to the following particulars. We mentioned in the preceding volume that the Sundays we call Septuagesima is called by the Greeks Prophone, because the opening of Lent is proclaimed on that day. The Monday, the Monday following it is counted as the first day of the next week, which is Apokrios, the name they give to the Sunday which closes that week, and which is our Sexagesima Sunday. The Greek church begins abstinence from flesh meat with this week. Then on the morrow, Monday, commences the week called Tyrifogus, which ends with the Sunday of that name, and which corresponds to our Quingasima. White meats are allowed during that week. Finally, the morrow is the first day of the first week of Lent, and the fast begins, with all severity, on that Monday. Whilst in the Latin church, it is deferred to the Wednesday. During the whole of Lent, at least of the Lent preceding Easter, milk, meats, eggs, and even fish are forbidden. The only food permitted to be eat eaten with bread is vegetables, honey, and for those who live near the sea, shellfish. For many centuries, wine might not be taken, but it is now permitted, and on the Annunciation and Palm Sunday, a dispensation is granted for eating fish. Besides the Lent preparatory to the Feast of Easter, the Greeks keep three others in the year that which is called of the Apostles, which lasts from the octave of Pentecost to the feasts of St. Peter and Paul, that of the Virgin Mary, which begins on the 1st of August and ends with the Vigil of the Assumption, and lastly, the Lent of Preparation for Christmas, which consists of 40 days. The fasting and abstinence of these three Lents are not quite so severe as those observed during the Great Lent. The other, if Christian nations of the East, also observe several Lents, and more rigidly than the Greeks, but all these details would lead us too far. We therefore pass on to the mysteries which are included in this holy season.